It's the most common form of transport in the world. We all do it a little differently, but it's our most common way to travel. Walking is immediate, carbon-free, and free. Just people connecting directly with their environment and with those around them. Walking creates communities. It's also healthy. We've long known that regular walking can reduce our risk of a whole host of chronic diseases, but recent studies have directly linked living in walkable neighborhoods with lower rates of obesity and diabetes. Good for health, good for the environment, good for the community. Walking is a basic human right. So why are so many of our urban spaces so hard to walk in? The answer is simple. In the world's biggest and fastest growing cities, people have been displaced by cars, and cities designed for cars are not good for pedestrians. Millions risk their lives every day to get where they need to go. All over the world, half of the 1.3 million people killed in road crashes each year are pedestrians, cyclists, or motorcyclists. Traffic injuries are the leading cause of death in people 15 to 29. Traffic collisions also cause between 20 and 50 million injuries every year and are a major cause of disability. In the world's fastest growing cities, deaths from traffic collisions are expected to grow to 2.4 million a year by 2030, even though the majority of the people in these cities don't own cars. In African cities such as Kinshasa and Dar es Salaam, 70% of the population travel primarily by foot or bicycle. In Asian cities like Guangzhou and Manila, around half do. More than 90% of the world's road deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries, but these countries only have 48% of the world's vehicles. Despite the hazards of a car-focused environment and the many benefits of walking, most cities still spend the majority of their transport budget building more roads for cars, making life ever more hazardous for pedestrians. These investments encourage more people to drive, which creates yet more demand for cars. And so the cycle continues. But we can change that cycle. We can use OpenStreetMap to help measure and understand walkability in cities all around the world. My name is Taylor Rich. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a research associate at the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, where I work on Pedestrians First. Pedestrians First is a tool, a website, that ITDP hopes to release in September to help people in cities all around the globe understand, measure, and advocate for walkability locally. Um, walkability is very important, and I hope that that last video helped you understand some of why. But walkability is especially important right now because walkability is part of a coronavirus recovery strategy. Uh, research has found that people in China, especially in China's biggest cities like Guangzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing, are walking more now than they did before the virus. Um, People have gotten out of metro trains and buses and put on their shoes and started walking to get where they need to go. Um, walking is especially important for coronavirus recovery when sidewalks are wide enough um, because it enables people to move around the city at a safe social distance. Uh, of course, that means that we have to invest in walkability and actually build infrastructure for walking to make sure that it's safe enough to be used as transportation during coronavirus recovery. Um, walkability is very complicated, though. It's a lot more than just a sidewalk. There are many details. There are many factors. And walkability is something that we have to talk about at many different scales, from the size of the block to the entire size of the city. That's why ITVP has divided pedestrians first into four different tools. Um, the first three of them, the street measurement tool, the neighborhood measurement tool, and the transit system measurement tool, um, really rely on very fine details, often things like the presence or absence of street furniture, the shape of a sidewalk, the, the way that the curb um, creates a boundary between a sidewalk and a street. And then at the neighborhood scale, we have to talk about things like the exact distribution of services, the variety of transit options are available, that are available in order to support walking, um, the, the ways that the buildings meet the street. Are they, are they lively? Do they contribute to a sense of neighborhood activity and vitality? Or are they sort of cold and dead without lots of windows? Um, and these sorts of things can really only be measured by a human being who's familiar 
with uh, the street or neighborhood that we're trying to measure. Um, but in order to understand the walkability, walkability at a city level, we found that OpenStreetMap is actually a, an incredibly powerful source of data to help us, help us measure several different indicators of walkability that are meaningful at a citywide scale. Uh, what does that look like? Well, um, let me show you a demonstration. Um, here is the city of Cape Town, where I wish we could all be right now so that I could see you all in person and get to talk to you. Um, but maybe looking at it on a map will be almost as good. Uh, the first indicator that pedestrians first can use OpenStreetMap to measure is the indicator of block density. Um, smaller blocks are better for walkability. In a city made of small blocks, it's easy to walk directly from point A to point B um, and choose the most comfortable way to do so without having to go in a wide detour all around a building or an obstacle. Um, we can see here that this neighborhood is seems to be relatively walkable. It's composed largely of fairly small blocks and makes it easy to get from point A to point B. Similarly, this neighborhood also seems to be fairly walkable. Uh, but the two are divided from each other by this, this parkway um, and the very large blocks that accompany it, which I would imagine, I unfortunately can't actually go there this weekend, um, probably makes it very difficult for people to walk from one of these neighborhoods to the other. Um, another indicator of walkability is the degree of access that people have to daily social services, especially schools and healthcare. Um, now, we would have loved to include other services in this measurement as well, um, but we found that schools and healthcare were really the only key everyday social services that um, we could get reliable open street map data for all around the world. And it is very meaningful to be able to say that in certain neighborhoods, but not in others, people are able to walk distances of less than a kilometer in order to access these vital services. The next indicator of walkability, which unfortunately is not available in Cape Town, is transit. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, and the final indicator is the presence of car-free streets and places. Um, we do this using a variety of OpenStreetMap tags, um, but it, it's meant to include um, alleyways, parks, plazas, car-free streets. Anywhere where it would be safe for a young child to play in the street without risk of, of injury from, from a car collision. Um, of course, the real value of the OpenStreetMap data is that it doesn't just give us access to Cape Town, but of course, there are hundreds, even thousands of cities all around the world that we're able to analyze using these methods. Um, I'm going to zoom in over here in India, Delhi, and show you what it looks like when we're able to have data for transit access. Um, these are all of the areas within Delhi where people can walk less than 500 meters in order to access transit that will, arri that will arrive every 10 minutes or more frequently throughout the day. Um, transit, of course, sorry, uh, supports walkability very critically by connecting walkable neighborhoods to each other and allowing people um, to people without cars to get places that they can't really walk to quickly. Um, uh, we, we do have OpenStreetMap data all around the world, including, of course, um, data is often more accurate, uh, or at least more available in Europe. Um, you can see this very impressive measurement of very many Parisians having access to frequent transit, to healthcare, and to schools. Um, but there are also a number of limitations, uh, unfortunately enough. Just a second. Um, before I talk about those limitations, I'm sure you might be wondering um, how we process OpenStreetMap data. Um, we use three main sources of open data. Um, in addition to OpenStreetMap's planet.pbf, of course, we call on GTFS, um, that's General Transit Feed Specification, data. This is produced by transit agencies around the world and aggregated by openmobilitydata.org. 
Um, we also reference population density information from the global human settlement layer produced by the European Commission. Um, in order to process OpenStreetMap data, um, we read it into Python using um, OSM convert and then reading it using OSM NX. Um, we then process it using a variety of open source libraries. Shapely, of course, is the most important. Um, and we identify city amenities, as I showed you, schools, healthcare, and car-free areas, as well as the city streets that go into helping us understand the walkable network to determine which people actually have access to schools and healthcare. Um, it's very important. We're not just drawing circular buffers around schools and healthcare. We're actually tracing along the OpenStreetMap street networks to see what are the walking paths that people will actually follow as they walk from their homes to these destinations. Um, I really welcome you to check out the code yourself. It's free and open source on GitHub. Um, the code's not exactly beautiful. Sorry, the URL spells out uh, pedestrians first. Um, but I'd, I'd love to have your insight on it, um, your suggestions about how we can do things better. Um, I'm really not an expert on these things, and you are. Um, I mentioned, though, that there are a few problems that we encounter using OpenStreetMap data. Um, the most obvious might just be that OpenStreetMap data is different quality levels in different parts of the world. Um, North America and Europe often just have better data than Africa or India. And this can really unfortunately propagate a kind of uh, unintentional Eurocentrism by which pedestrians first ends up saying that European cities are more walkable um, than cities in Africa, even though Cairo may be just as walkable, if not more walkable than Paris, uh, but the data just isn't there to, to demonstrate it. Um, I've really been wondering lately if there's any way to sort of adjust our rankings to to show the relative sort of the, the the importance of the relative levels of data quality, and I'd love to talk more about that question of quantifying OpenStreetMap accuracy uh, after the talk. Um, the other limitation, of course, is that we can only measure things that have reasonably good data. Um, so we can measure healthcare and schools but we can't measure childcare or access to food, um, which are two really, really fundamental things in making a neighborhood walkable because they're services that people need to access every day of their lives. Um, sort of a subtler issue, um, and one that's maybe a little more difficult to talk about, is the way that OpenStreetMap data and the model of data reflects car normativity. Um, you know, the model was, for the most part, designed and developed by people who own or have access to cars. Um, as they designed the model, it reflected their unconscious assumptions about what a city is, how it's navigated. Um, streets, for example. Streets and roads and highways of all kinds are represented always and fundamentally as linear paths that are traversed to get from one place to another. But in many, if really not all, cities around the world, streets serve a much, streets certainly serve a function of travel, but streets also serve a function of being a public space. Streets are where children play. Streets are where people come together and see their neighbors and talk. Um, in many parts of the world, streets are where daily business is conducted. Streets are where you buy and sell daily necessities like food. Um, and because the OpenStreetMap data model sort of inherently treats streets as linear, I'm concerned that it misses the value that city streets have as sites of community. Um, that doesn't necessarily come out in pedestrians first directly, but I do think it's a really fundamental issue that, that we need to address. 
Um, similarly, it, it's very troublesome, really, that there's no single standard for representing front paths, um, whether as parallel ways. When I say footpaths, I, I mean what we in the United States call sidewalks, what people in England call pavements. Um, there's no single way of, of representing them. Um, they can be represented as tags, as ways of their own, um, and there are sort of different competing ideas about how to do that. Um, and that, you know, we can write code that understands all of those ways, but it is kind of problematic that there's no agreement, that there's, there's not really a standard agreement. Um, I'm going to talk about informal sharing of streets on the next slide, um, and also of uh, road crossings. Um, so shared streets, right? As I was saying, streets are used for a lot more than just car travel or travel from one location to another. And that's true both in the developing and the developed world. Um, in places like the Netherlands, right, there's this idea of the shared street, which is often used using the living street, um, highway tag on open street map. Um, it's a successful idea. Um, and, and it's really good for walkability. But it also is a concept that's being done informally in cities all across the globe. And often those locations aren't tagged using the living street um, identifier. There's also this question of informal pedestrian connections. Um, I've got two examples for you. This is the first one. Both examples are from, um, from my own city of Washington, DC. Um, this street is, it's, it's really important. It, um, this, sorry, this is not the street, but this, this dirt path here, um, because it is what connects an entire neighborhood here, Faraday Place Northeast, Faraday Place Northeast, up to the Fort Totten Metro Station. And so in order to get from, from this residential neighborhood to access transit, as people do on a daily basis, they have to follow this dirt path. Now, this path happens to be tagged on OpenStreetMap. Um, that's really good. It means that it can be included as we measure people's access to transit and pedestrians first. But there's this footpath in Tyson's, uh, an area of Northern Virginia in the suburbs, where there's this, similarly, a dirt footpath which, can, which connects a transit stop to a neighborhood, in this case, a commercial neighborhood, uh, a shopping mall, rather than a residential neighborhood. Um, and it's, that marker should be here, that path, but it's just not marked on OpenStreetMap. And so it makes it much, much more difficult, it makes it impossible, right, for us to include the impacts of this transit in terms of um, access. So why is one located and the other not? I don't know. Um, next question. How can we talk about safe crossings of streets? Um, of course, there are, there are tags, there are ways for crosswalks and for pedestrian overpasses. Um, but there's not necessarily a, a, it's hard for me to understand based on the, the highway tags when it is and when it isn't safe for people to cross a street or a road. Um, of course it is a gradation, right? Um, some streets will be safe for, you know, athletic, able-bodied men that, to cross that aren't safe for the elderly or the very young, um, but when when the open street map community talks about these definitions of streets in terms of their capacity and their speeds for cars, we also need to be talking about what these designations mean for the people who are walking alongside or across the same streets. And I think we need to have a better understanding of the ways that that streets and highways can separate as well as connect communities. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities, and I, I don't mean to be overly critical here, um, but I think it is really important for us to understand how um, better pedestrian connectivity data, better amenity location data, um, better understanding of what highways in the open street map sense mean for pedestrians as well as for vehicles. Um, and, and I really hope to be part of these conversations moving forward. Um, 
We, of course, also have lots of opportunities at ITDP in terms of how we can expand pedestrians first. I'm especially excited about the potential for using some form of computer vision to assess the quality of streets, sidewalks at the street and neighborhood level, not only at the city level. Um, and I'd love to have conversations about any and all of these afterward. Um, first, of course, I want to thank all of the partners and sources of data. Um, a special thanks to Mapbox, uh, for the Mapbox community team's support in developing our visualization, um, and to the Bernard Van Leer Foundation for funding this project. Um, but most of all, thanks to you. Um, thanks for your attention, thanks for your time, and thanks in advance for all the insight that I hope you'll share with me during the conversation and by email at taylor.rich at ittp.org. Um, have a great time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. about the potential for using some form of computer vision to assess the quality of streets, sidewalks, Uh, okay, so um, still having some technical issues. Um, but yeah. Um, hey there. So um where where Is the project currently at at the moment? Is it something that's live? Yeah. Um, hi, Gregory. Hi, um, audience. Thank you so much for your time. Um, the project is not currently live. Um, we finished sort of processing all the data. Um, we are currently Hi. Um, we have data for all cities above five hundred thousand residents, as measured by the European Commission's Urban Center database. Um, That definitely includes Berlin. We're looking at going smaller, but we do start running into OSM data quality issues.
for cities smaller than that, which just don't have any locations of services, for example. Um, so going a bit into the data you're using, I don't think you covered this, but um, have you been using elevation at all to factor in walkability and how far people can walk? That's a terrific question. Um, So we do work with our field offices around the world and try and get their perspectives on what they're looking for in terms of measuring walkability, but it's a very limited Um, sort of test audience. And so if you have any ideas, um, please, uh, I asked some questions in the pad. I would love to hear your answers to how you think you could use Heads First in your city or reach out to me by email, taylor. Rich, R E S C H, at IDDP.org. I would love to just. Talk to you about this. Cool. Oh, yeah. So um, I'll just read out those questions in the pad. That are further down. Okay. Um, um, can you imagine using pedestrian first in your city? If so, how?
Yes, a security in African cities. Great. Um, no, that's that's such an important question. Thank you for bringing up the topic. <clears throat> um, we can't really do anything with OpenStreetMap data on this. As far as I know, I don't have any any brilliant ideas. Um, we try to address this concern when we talk about measuring walkability more qualitatively at the street and neighborhood level. Um, with the self-survey tools, the neighborhood and street tools that we also developed for pedestrians first. Um, um, and we've, ITDB has also released um, a publication called Access for all uh, that I believe addresses some of these issues, um, particularly around gender uh, and urban mobility. Um, and that's Too. Great. Um, yeah, it's a great idea. I don't think ITDP has the capacity, um, but I'd be very interested in working with you on this. Cool. Yeah, so um, that's the questions I'll ask, but there's the pad there that people can uh, communicate with you in, and I'm sure you'll be watching that and posting things. Um, sorry, oh. we've had a few technical difficulties and uh, You've done great to sometimes repeat your answers. Um, I think we're going to probably restart some things and uh, we'll be back for um, Ilya's going to lead us in an OpenStreetMap quiz. I'm hoping I can enter. I'm not sure how difficult it will be, but I'm sure it'll be great fun. Um, so I'll leave it there and um, yeah, keep watching the stream for when we restart. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory, um, for your terrific work just now and throughout the whole conference. And everyone, I hope you have a very good evening.